Luke, it's yours, brother. Okay. It is my privilege and honor to be with you today, uh, to be it's part awesome. of this Italian theology class. Uh, Superintendent Mark asked me to say a little bit about myself. I am uh, very thankful to be the pastor of a small Free Methodist church in Ripon, California. My wife, Jenny, and I have been married almost 14 years. We have three boys. Uh, one of them is nine, one of them is six, and one of them is one. Um, so he's crazy and climbs everything. Uh, and wonderful. And I'm very thankful for all of that. I don't know if there's anything else you'd like me to share in introduction or if we should get right into our topic. Okay, very good. As Superintendent Mark said, it's a little bit strange talking about this topic at the end of a theology class instead of the beginning of a theology class, because the topic that I'm here to discuss with you today is the part of theology that everything else we believe is built on top of. It's a little bit like trying to lay a foundation for a house that's already there and slip the foundation under it somehow. Uh, wow. But that will be okay. We will be, we will be well. Um, <laughs> the question for this period of time is, who is God? And specifically in this class, who is God as John Wesley explained it in his day? Um, as the author of the book for this class, uh, Mr. Collins has done a much better job than I could drawing from all of Wesley's many writings. Mostly I'll be going straight from Collins' book in chapters one, chapter three, and chapter four. Um, from the theology of John Wesley. First, the nature and character of God. Who is God the Father? Uh, Wesley taught that God is spirit. His nature is spirit. He does not have a body or part necessarily. And that God's most important defining character traits are love and holiness. Amen. And that those two must always be together. It would make sense or be true of God's character to describe his love without talking about his holiness. Or to talk about his holiness without also talking about his love. Wesley taught that everything else we can say about God is understood best in the terms of God's love and holiness. So that will come around again and again as we move forward. Uh, humans love in many different ways. When I say I love my wife, I mean something very different than when I say I love my brother, which is very different from when I say I love my friend. And all of those are very different from when I say I love my favorite food. Many different ways that I use the word love, but God's love is specific and consistent. God's love is a holy love. It is not a cold, judgmental holiness either. It is a loving holiness. So the two must be put together and cannot be separated. God has several unique qualities that describe ways for us in which God is limitless and cannot be measured. First, God is eternal. God cannot be limited by time. God is the only being who is eternal, Wesley would say, in two directions. If we look into the past, God had no beginning. He is eternal looking into the past. If we look into the future, God has no end. So he is eternal facing the future also. We, God has created. So we were not eternal looking into the past. Although he made us with eternal souls looking forward, 
into the future. So God is unique in that God is the only being that is eternal in both directions, looking backward and looking forward. He is not bound by time. This is how Wesley understands the name that God gives God's self in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, when God says, I am that I am. And when God says, this is what you have to tell the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God's nature is to exist. This is also how Wesley expounds on the many places in the Bible that describe God as being from everlasting to everlasting. Wesley would say that's referring to God's eternal nature, both backward and forward. So we can say God is present in every moment without any exceptions. God is eternal, not limited by time. Second, God is omnipresent, meaning God is not limited by place or space. God exists everywhere that is at the same time. In Jeremiah 23, 24, God declares, do I not fill heaven and earth? And he does. God is both present in every part of creation and above and beyond creation. So everywhere that I think of that exists, God is there. And he is not bound by everywhere I can think of that exists. He exists outside of the creation that he made also. He is omnipresent. He is not bound by space. Third, God is omniscient. He is all-knowing. If God is present, Wesley said, in all places at all times, then God knows everything that has happened or is happening or will happening, how it happens and why. So that's how Wesley explained that God is all-knowing. If even if he was not to begin with, which he was all-knowing to begin with, he would be all-knowing by being all places at all times. Um, so God is not limited by time. He is eternal. God is not limited by space. He is omnipresent. God is not limited in knowledge. He is omniscient. Fourth, God is omnipotent. He has all power. He is not limited in any way in his ability. God is the spring of action in every creature, visible and invisible, which could neither act nor exist without the continued influx and agency of his almighty power. And that was not my fancy verbiage. That was a quote from Wesley. When some Christians consider that God has all power, they then imagine that God has decided everything that will occur and that everything is therefore a direct result of God's power. Wesley disagrees. Wesley observes that God uses his immeasurable power to do something that would otherwise be impossible which is to give all of us as humans free will. We could not have the ability to make decisions on our own unless God chose with all of his power to enable us to do that. And this relates to the topic of predestination, which might come up later tonight, I'm not sure. If God is present in all times and in all places all at once, then God already knows who of us will choose to put their trust in God and who will not. As God already knows who will choose to trust in God, God can predestine, can decide ahead of time that everyone who chooses him will also be 
remade in the image of God's son, Jesus. God predestines us on the basis of our own free choice, which he gave us in all his power to put our faith in Jesus. Um, these are the ways, some of the ways, there are probably more than I can think of or that Wesley could write about, that God is unlimited. Uh, let's talk about, again, some of God's other character traits. God is the God of holy love. God is eternal, present everywhere, knowing everything and having all power. And in addition to these traits, Wesley talked about God the Father's roles in God's relationship with ours as humans. It's important to say that Wesley did not separate the tasks of God and say, God the Father does these things, and Jesus does these things, and the Holy Spirit does these things. Wesley was very clear that there are no separations of, uh, of function and task within God, but he did discuss them in terms of roles in their relationship with us as humans. God the Father, he said, is creator. God brought everything that exists into being out of nothing, and God continues to sustain all existence. He said God is sovereign meaning God is free to do as he pleases with the creation that he made. As sovereign, God has decided to give us this meaningful freedom to make real choices, but he can still do as he pleases. Even though God is sovereign, we are not just reflections of God's decisions. God empowers us to make our own decisions, which is amazing. I'm constantly in awe of this. Uh, third, God is governor of all the creatures God has made. As governor, God acts in accordance with God's holiness, in justice and also in grace. As the guy in charge, that's what he chooses to do. He makes choices consistent with his character. Also as governor, he provides us with a moral law. The basic rules of right and wrong that are in our hearts, that come from God, flowing from who God is as the God of holy love. God is also our provider, which means that sometimes God chooses to break the natural laws that God put in place in creation so that we can receive a blessing by miracle. That's what a miracle is, right? God has set the world to work in certain ways, but he can also step in and say, right now, this is what's going to happen, because this is what I desire for you in your life. So God is the God of holy love. God is eternal, present everywhere, knowing everything, having all power. God is creator, sovereign, governor, moral law, and provider. Next, let's talk about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Wesley's theology is, as it should be, centered on Christ. Almost everything Wesley taught referred back to Christ, possibly everything. Wesley understood both the Old Testament and the New Testament as being about Christ. He taught that Christ is one person with two natures. A person is identified and differentiated and separated by that person's relationships with other people in some sense, at least from our perspective. You can identify a person as being related to somebody else or as being different from somebody else. The relationships are one way to talk about who somebody is. Jesus and our understanding of him as one person with two natures is best understood by talking about his relationship with God the Father and his relationship with humankind. He's called in scripture both the Son of God and also the Son of Man. 
So first we'll talk about him as the son of God. He's defined first by his relationship with God the Father. He is the word of God. He is the son of God. These are titles we know are given to him in the scripture. And these relationship words show us his divine nature. He shares important traits with God the Father that we do not share. He is eternal without beginning and without end. He is equal in essence with God the Father. They are the same being. And it is not enough just to say that they have the same job or the same tasks. That does not go far enough. It is not enough to say that they hold or deserve the same level of honor. That does not go far enough in explaining their relationship. They are the same essence, the same substance, the same God. Jesus, therefore, was present and active in creation. He is also the sole creator of all things because he is one with the Father. Genesis chapter 1 tells us that God spoke creation into being. And John chapter 1 tells us that Jesus is the word of God. So it's true, even on a level that I can understand, simple though I am, that through Jesus, all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. The roles of God the Father, therefore, also apply to Jesus, according to Wesley. Creator, sustainer, governor, provider. Wesley also discussed Jesus as the Redeemer. An additional role, which he includes God the Father in, but he primarily discusses Jesus as the Redeemer. So this is Jesus' first defining relationship for us seeking to understand him. He is one with God the Father, therefore he is divine in nature. Jesus' second defining relationship, as far as we can understand him, is with humankind. Jesus, the word of God, becoming human, being made flesh, shows a constant balance in God between the transcendence of God, that God is great and above us and far different from us, and at the same time, the imminence of God. That in Christ, God is also present and near to humanity and accessible. It was important to Wesley, looking at these two attributes of God, which are both always true, that God is transcendent and immediate. He emphasized that God comes to us, which means God's natural automatic place would be far separate from us and far different from us. But God chooses by God's own power to change that situation on purpose and come near to us as humans. This is the second relationship of Christ that shows us who Christ is. He became a human being without losing his godhood. So he has two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. Wesley firmly believed this. He consistently taught that Jesus had two natures and was both God and human. But Wesley was very careful not to emphasize Jesus' humanity too much. He was afraid that when Christians refer to Jesus in close and personal terms, that we would forget that he is also God. And that we would start treating Jesus as though he were any other person. So he affirmed that Jesus is God and human. One person, two natures. But he was careful in the way he talked about Jesus. 
not to accidentally belittle or oversimplify him. Wesley also talked about Jesus fulfilling several different roles that only he could fulfill for humanity because he was both God and human. First, he talked about Jesus as a prophet, meaning that as prophet, Jesus communicates God's truth to us. As the God of holiness and love, Jesus was a teacher of that truth, especially the truth of the way that humans are supposed to relate to and connect to God. Many Christians have believed that Jesus came to teach us that the grace of God overcame and replaced moral law. Wesley saw that this was not true. Jesus taught both the law of God and the grace of God. As such, when Christ gave the Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew and talked about love as God's true standard of righteousness, he was not abolishing the law. He was completing our understanding of the law. God is the God of holiness and love, and they always go together in the things of God. They always show us more about each other. If we understand God's holiness more deeply, it will help us understand his love. And the opposite is also true. So as God is holy, his law is important to him and to us. And as God is love, his grace is important and works together with the law, not against it. This is what Wesley taught about what Jesus taught as the prophet we needed because God's followers did not understand that until Jesus came to teach it. Jesus is our prophet. Second, Jesus is our priest. As a priest, he is a mediator between God and humankind. Jesus is able to function as our mediator because he is both God and human. This is absolutely essential to humanity having any access to God at all. Unless God himself chose to be our mediator, God would only be transcendent, far off and different, and would not be immediate and close and available. We could not become mediators and reach out to God. He had to become the mediator and come to us. Humanity has, we know, a problem. And our problem is sin. And since we are the problem, we would never be able to come up with a solution to our problem. We required a mediator to connect us with God. Jesus makes this connection with God possible as part of prevenient grace. The grace of God that is shown to us and given to us even before we put our faith in God. That God has reached out first and made himself available is part of prevenient grace. Also, as our priest, Jesus became the sacrifice necessary for our atonement. Wesley wrote that nothing in the Christian system is of greater consequence than the doctrine of atonement. And that a preacher's main and constant business is to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. The idea of Jesus as an atonement for sin is clearly a role that goes beyond that of prophet. It's not just communicating truth. There's more that Jesus does. It was important to Wesley in teaching about the atonement that initiating grace, starting the work of connecting us with God is God's job alone. Con at the same time and together with Jesus, our mediator, but it is not our job, we could not do it. But God chooses to make receiving that grace a work of God but also a work we must participate in, that God enables us to participate in. 
So although Jesus' death was sufficient, it was enough for all of humankind's sin to be forgiven. The satisfaction for sin only works for those who have received it. Wesley wrote, we are justified freely, but on certain terms and conditions. <laughs> I like the way he said that. The condition is that we receive it, like someone who is offered money, but must hold out their hands to receive it or they will not possess it. So Jesus is our prophet. Jesus is our priest and atonement. And third, Jesus is our king. Since Jesus bought humanity with his blood, he has ownership of us. As king, Jesus gives laws to all those in his kingdom. He works together with his role as priest to teach the law of God. As king, Jesus also restores us to the image of God. In this way, the kingship of Jesus partners with the priestly function of Jesus and the atoning sacrifice. So these three offices, we might say, of Jesus are not separated. They are all one continuous function of what Jesus does in our lives. They are only separated by Wesley and other teachers to help us understand the work of Christ. As king, Jesus sets us free from the power of sin, offering us sanctifying grace that follows after the job he did as priest, offering us justifying grace. Wesley explained that connection between Jesus' kingship and sanctification, saying that Jesus reigns in all believing hearts until he has subdued all things to himself until he hath utterly cast out all sin and brought in everlasting righteousness. Jesus is one person with two natures. He's both fully God and fully human. And because this is true, he and only he can be the prophet, the priest, and the king that we need. Okay. Let's move on and talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was very important to John Wesley. The way he wrote about it was different than many other writers have written about it. And I hope that I do justice communicating his perspective. We've talked about God the Father and who he is. And Jesus, who is God the Son. And now we can talk about the Holy Spirit. The Christian faith requires more than just understanding what is true. It requires a way of living, and even deeper than a way of living, it requires a way of being, of who and what we are, that is guided by the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit carries out God's redemption within believers. Wesley wrote, that even before justification, the Holy Spirit preveniently opens the eyes of our understanding, bringing us out of darkness into marvelous light. And without the Holy Spirit, he talked about us as though we were asleep to the things of God. That the Holy Spirit awakens us so that we can see the truth. We can't even seek confession and forgiveness until we have seen the truth of our situation. And the Holy Spirit does that, which means the Holy Spirit is working in people before they receive Jesus, before they ask for forgiveness. Wesley talks about the Spirit drawing us to repentance in two different steps. First, the Spirit is mediated through the Word, the Word Jesus. When we hear the moral law of God and the promises of the gospel, and we understand them by the Spirit, we are led to know and to understand our sin, meaning the sin of our actual choices, 
things that I have done wrong and to seek repentance and faith and to receive forgiveness for our actual, personal, individual sins. But Wesley also talks about the spirit making us aware, not just of our sinful choices, but of inbred sin, sin that's part of what and who we are as humans, not just what I have done, Luke, as an individual. The Spirit also leads us to discover and understand that we are, in fact, broken. Justification, Wesley says, is not complete until we have repented of sin on both of these levels. That I understand I have made sinful choices and need forgiveness. And that I understand I am a broken creature because of sin in humanity. And I need forgiveness and new life. I need to not just be um, pardoned. I need to be remade and reborn by the Holy Spirit. After justification, the new birth has remade us. So the spirit, which has already been at work in us, now relates to us in a new way. This new relationship changes what we are and gives us a quality that we never had before and could not have had without the spirit. And that quality is holiness. This holiness is not the holiness we talk about as a gradual growth in changes in our actions and attitudes. That holiness is sanctification. This is a sudden change within us where we gain the quality holiness because the Holy Spirit is within us. And we could not get it any other way. This means, according to Wesley, that the, the good works, the good things that we might choose to do can now actually be good because they flow from the spirit of God and not just out of my brokenness as a human. Wesley worried that the Methodists would focus too much on outward holiness, on holiness in our actions and would neglect the inward change that the Holy Spirit brings. He wrote, true religion does not consist in external observances, but in righteousness, the image of God stamped on the heart, the love of God and man accompanied with the peace that passes all understanding and joy in the Holy Ghost. In Wesley's writings, he also emphasized and spent a great deal of time trying to explain the assurance that the Holy Spirit gives us. He spent a lot of time arguing <laughs> with other Christian leaders who did not understand his position or who disagreed pointedly. Um, he referred to passages like Romans chapter 8, 16, which says the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And he understood this assurance of salvation to be present in the life of the Christian on two different levels, which he called the direct witness and the indirect witness of the spirit. The indirect witness of the spirit has to do with observing evidence of the change God brings in a person's life. That evidence includes the fruit of the spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. It includes a conscious, a conscience free of offense, Wesley said, and it includes keeping the moral law as an expression of the will of God. So the indirect witness of the Holy Spirit is that we and other people can look at our lives as Christians 
and say, wow, that person has changed. I see the fruit of the spirit in their actions. I see that they live according to the moral law of God. And we can look at ourselves and say, I see that I do not feel the guilt and pressure of my sins any longer. That's the indirect witness. The direct testimony of the spirit, Wesley taught, is not observable. It's not even fully explainable to someone who has not experienced it. Wesley felt that if you do not have the direct testimony of the Holy Spirit, you cannot fully understand it yet based on someone else's telling you about it. He wrote that the direct witness is an inward impression of the soul, whereby the Spirit of God immediately and directly witnesses to my spirit that I am a child of God, that Jesus hath loved me and given himself for me, that all my sins are blotted out, and I, even I, am reconciled to God. <sighs> Wesley believed that the indirect and the direct testimony of the Spirit should be present in the life of every believer. He taught that like sanctification, the assurance of the spirit is begun in a moment as a qualitative change of who and what we are, but that it also grows by stages as a Christian matures and understands God's promises more. He described the progression in this way. I love this. A natural man has neither fear nor love. One that is awakened, fear without love. A babe in Christ, love and fear. A father in Christ, love without fear. The growing understanding of the Spirit's testimony within our spirits that we are children of God. We've talked about God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit of God. It's important for us to talk just a little more about the Trinity as a whole, and indeed about the word Trinity. We use the word Trinity, of course, to refer to the Godhead, all three of them being one. Wesley, emphasized the unity of the Trinity more often than the diversity of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He emphasized that they share the same work, that they are united in all of their functions. And Wesley used and supported the use of the word Trinity. But still he often avoided using it himself in favor of referring to God by describing God calling God the three one God in several places or listing all three persons of the Trinity rather than just saying the Trinity. In discussion, he supported the, what we call the Western view of the Trinity, which is specifically about the Holy Spirit, that at, that, at a time in the past, the Eastern church, and still to this day, insisted that the Holy Spirit proceeds from, comes from God the Father only and not from Jesus, and then in the Western Church, uh, we say rather that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, completing, if you will, the triangle that they're all three of them connected, and trying to avoid a hierarchy um, in God, in our understanding of God. He agreed with that, um, but he focused more on describing the relationships between God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit in terms that the Bible uses, instead of in terms that our Christian churches has come up with over time, like the word Trinity 
or by over focusing on who does the Holy Spirit proceed from. He focused on the way that the scripture talks about the relationships within God, one God, three persons. Here's one last Wesley quote about the Trinity. And with this, I will finish my portion, my lecture portion, and we can discuss and ask questions if there are some. Wesley wrote this. But I know not how anyone can be a Christian believer till he hath, as St. John speaks, the witness in himself. Till the spirit of God witnesses with his spirit that he is a child of God. That is, in effect, till God the Holy Ghost witnesses that God the Father has accepted him through the merits of Jesus the Son. And having this witness, he honors the Son and blessed the Spirit, even as he honors the Father. I felt that that quote fit all of this, the three members of the Trinity, the assurance of salvation, the closeness and unity between God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the way they, re they relate to us as humans in as few words as possible. <laughs> uh, with that, my, my lecture is ended, you could say, and thank you very much for participating with me. Um, let's move to a time of discussion and of questions. Amen. First, everybody, let's give it up and say thank you, Pastor Luke Jones. That was, Thanks be to God. Yeah, really outstanding. Thank you, Pastor Luke Jones. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is just... <laughs> Go in a circle and ask if anybody has any questions or comments about the lecture, which was a broad and sweeping lecture about the nature of God, the nature of Jesus, the nature of the Holy Spirit, and the Trinity, the fundamentally most important doctrines in uh, Christianity. So uh, I'm going to ask Philomoni and then Lex, Sal, and then Vuni. You don't have to have uh, a question if you don't want. But if you have a question or a comment, I encourage you to go ahead and ask that. Pastor Philomoni, do you have anything that you would like to say or to ask of Luke? And thank you for helping with the technology. It appears that it's difficult to unmute. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, move on and ask Pastor Lex, do you have any questions or comments for Luke? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. McAdams. Uh, and I would like to thank the Lord and I would like to thank Mr. Jones for, for, for your teaching that I learned a lot. I just want, to, I just want uh, you just to say it again, the last quote, really. It really lends my, my, my thinking into John Wesley theology. I'm happy to. There's a lot there in that quote. But I know not how anyone can be a Christian believer till he hath, as St. John speaks, the witness in himself. Good. Till the so Spirit of God witnesses with his spirit that he is a child of God. That is, in effect, till God the Holy Ghost witnesses that God the Father has accepted him through the merits of God the Son. And having this witness, he honors the Son and the Blessed Spirit, even as he honors the Father. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, Pastor Sal, do you have any comments or questions for Pastor Luke? Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Luke Jones for 
wonderful presentation uh, this, uh, this afternoon. And I've learned a lot from it. And uh, thank you very much for enlightening uh, every details about the Trinity and the details about uh, the goddess, uh, goddess of Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have learned a lot from it. I have no questions at all, but thank you for detailed presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Sal. Pastor Vuni, do you have any questions for <coughs> Pastor Luke? Um, uh, no, Pastor, but uh, I thank the Lord uh, because uh, the way the presentation has been done, um, uh, it teaches me a lot because we have to have the full conviction of the Holy Spirit uh, it goes together with uh, what we have uh, learned uh, in our Sunday service this morning, the work of the Holy Spirit, to have that full conviction that uh, we have been forgiven and uh, uh, yeah, I thank the Lord because uh, we are not uh, uh, walking uh, blindly. Because uh, that is the promise of the Father, that uh, we should have the Holy Spirit. And I thank uh, Mr. James for elaborating more on the subject. Yeah, thank you very much. Outstanding. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Luke, thank you so much for your investment of time in this. Um, brothers, we are going to take a five-minute break. So feel free to turn off your...